Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's episode of the Mastering Retention Podcast. I'm Tom Haymond, uh, co-founder of UserWise and your host for today. Uh, today, I am delighted to have Hyder CW on. I think you might actually be the first person that shortens their last name to a, a, a CW, keep it simple. Um, so yeah, exciting stuff there. Um, Hyder, uh, before we really dive into things, um, I always like to ask, you know, like, What's your story? How'd you get into games? How'd you get to where you are? You want the quick story or the long story? Surprise us. I mean, audience, audience is sitting on their seats right now. Cool. Well, hi, my name's Heather. Like, nice to speak with y'all. Like, I've always wanted to make video games ever since I was eight years old. And I got really lucky and started my career as a quality engineer at Ubisoft. And then I was quickly promoted from engineer to junior game designer to a lead game designer. Then I joined EA for some time and then Vivendi. Then I went back to EA where I joined BioWare. And I currently work at Scopely on Marvel Strike Force as the economy design director. I've always been good with numbers and I feel super lucky to kind of have the opportunity to kind of use my craft and make video games like do something that I excel at and something I'm passionate about doing. That's great. So what does a director of economy actually do on a game that, you know, is already live? Like, don't you really just need like economy design when you're building the game initially? Actually, to be honest, like, I think you need more economy design when the game's live because now you have a player base playing your game and you have live data to make more data driven design decisions. Like you can model your game out right before shipping, like you do need economy design when you start a live service, but when you actually start the live service, you can kind of, you have a living, breathing economy where it becomes a lot more interesting working on a live game. But I'd say think about it like a TV show, right? Like, do you need to make episode one, but then you need to make episode two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And you have player feedback on how they kind of viewed your episode. So now you can kind of balance your episode and tailor it to their needs. Interesting. So when you're working on a live game from an economy standpoint, like are, are you mostly just like going back and rebalancing like the Fatui and the early levels? Is it mostly like in-game stuff? Is it like into in-game? Like yeah. how does it all work? Yeah. That's a great question. So I'd say balance wise, like I like to break the game into three stages. Like there's early game, which is more about your Fatui and more about players learning how to play the game, what's cool about your game, what gets them to come back the next day. So usually I do very little economy design work. Early game, it's more onboarding and getting players hooked to the game. But we do do some balance work, like in case the curve is too steep somewhere, we may probably shorten that thing down in the end. What players care about is the pace at which they unlock different reward systems or features in your game. And sometimes if it's too paced out early game, players can join. Or sometimes if it's too close to each other, players may get confused and overwhelmed and churn as well. So I feel there's some, uh, the Fatui can get some love, but it's more like my game design hat there where it's more about tuning different beats rather than playing around with numbers, but think about it like when I tune an XP curve, I like to look at all the beats you're gonna unlock and I'm just moving these beats closer or further apart. For this yeah. week, that's how I like to do it early game. Mid game on live services, I feel like the best mid game just doesn't exist. I wish I could get players <laughs> from early game to end game right away, but yeah. that's the case. But usually end game is the most engaging and highly retaining part of our games. And mid game is just your journey getting there. I really like, I think six months worth of mid game is good enough in most live services. But what happens if you see like, your year, like people add level caps and level caps and level caps, and nobody goes back and you know, solve and gives that mid game some love. So, what you have like over years of life service, you have like a, your, your game's out for five years, you probably have a two and a half year long mid game. And I really want that down to what it was when you shipped on day one because it's going to take a new player now two and a half years to get from early game to end game. And end game is where you know the biggest party is where where you have the deepest social connections, the most engaging features, where the live team can actually tailor the end game with events and to keep it more engaging, tailored to end game players. Yeah. 
I think it was um I may be getting this wrong, but I think it's the the Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes that has like this hundred dollar offer, like for kind of pretty early into the game, where if you buy it, it basically like gives you all this stuff and like teleports you to in game. You have all these champions and things like that. Um, have you seen that used elsewhere? Like, does is that thing actually make sense or? Yeah, I I think in the case of Galaxy of Heroes, I think it was called the Hyperdrive Bundle. And it makes sense when it's tailored only to your early game players, but if your end game players can buy resources at high value and use it on end game heroes, it's kind of beating the purpose. I think games like Destiny and World of Warcraft, they do it a lot more elegantly where in Destiny, see your end game starts at this power threshold called soft cap. And then you have your hard cap, which is like the max power threshold in the game. And every time they increase the caps, like the new soft cap becomes the previous hard cap. And now they have a brand new hard cap. So what they do is they get to get players to soft cap right away. They have this quest called like the emperor's journey and the emperor gives you an invitation and it just gives you really powerful rewards at that time. And it just got you to soft cap right away. But you couldn't use those rewards end game and suddenly at end game, you suddenly just get all this power at a really small cost. So it kind of devaluates your everything else at the end game. So now you're anchored on a very, very high juicy price point for with an offer tailored to early game players, which should not have been tailored for end game players. But we do like to keep our games fair and you know, ideally they should be fair. But I say instead of giving out resources, they could have just given out progress. And that would be a lot more elegant way to kind of <laughs> Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. So I think in the past you've mentioned, or to me, the concept of building relationships between rewards. Can you tell me what that actually means and why it matters? Yeah, I think so. Uh, at least with deeper games, like for a simple game like Candy Crush Saga, it probably doesn't matter as much. But for on more complex games, the more resources you have, players kind of value these rewards. Uh, in relationship to each other. So when you build relationships between your rewards and you model it from a player's point of view, you can actually balance your game better. It becomes a lot simpler to balance things like it takes you from a billion permutations to a million permutations to a thousand permutations to hundreds of permutations to tens of permutations when there are meaningful relationships between all the rewards in your game. And it makes my life easier. Like I. When I do and stuff, like everything's like related to each other. So when something goes up or down, it kind of, I need to think about it in relationship to everything else. Because economies are actually more about the holistic player experience. Uh, they're not like sometimes if a particular number is five or seven, doesn't actually matter much. And actually working with that, especially on the AAA space, sometimes they can get very passionate about, oh, this number needs to be a seven and not a five. And like, and in isolation, the seven on five doesn't matter. What matters is what, what that does for the player experience. So hey, if the summer is a five, like say you're getting five gold and you need 500 gold to max out your progression, that's a meaningful relationship. Whereas if this number is seven in isolation means pretty much nothing. Interesting. So do you recommend for people that are trying to like rebalance their economy or get it maybe a little bit more under control uh, to have some sort of spreadsheet that dictates these relationships between different rewards and things or do you use like a tool like uh, what is that machinations or different things like like what, what sort of tools and systems do you recommend folks use machinations is a cool tool but i love working with spreadsheets i work in usually work in spreadsheets directly um, Google Sheets or Excel either, but I prefer Google Sheets these days because it's easy to collaborate on. But an example is like more than a decade back when I was working on a builder, many times when you make these relationships between rewards, you people just look at the spreadsheet and they're buried in the spreadsheet and they don't think about the player experience. What really helped me is to model out different player personas and see how they're playing our game. Say for example, we're working on a builder and now we have different buildings, that, different types of buildings that give you uh, rewards uh, every day over time across different time periods. So let's say 
you have a strawberry building that gives you rewards every five minutes. And then you have a mango building that gives you rewards every hour. You have a pineapple building that gives you reward every 12 hours. And you have an apple building that gives you rewards every day, right? Mm -hmm. And when we model it, 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 if you're modeling out in spreadsheet, people will be like, okay, uh, five minutes worth of rewards means like, you know, X, they just use time as a constant, but that's not the way players play, right? You cannot expect your player to log in like uh, of every five minutes across a duration of 24 hours and collect those strawberries, right? You need to model it out, keeping like, uh, giving them eight hours of sleep and then using their actual play sessions. So then what we do is like we build player personas. We are saying, okay, persona A, like, you know, uh, their name is Jess, right? They, they play the game three times a day. They play 15 minute sessions. So now they're getting these many strawberries a day. They're getting three into like three, which is like nine strawberries a day. So to so use nine as a fundamental way to build relationships for strawberries, rather than 24 into, into 12, because it's a five minute timer. So you, you actually use a player persona and their profile. And then you say, okay, we have another player, let's say his name is Hyder, and he plays like 10 sessions a day for five minutes each. And yep. the amount of strawberries ever gets would be different. So we actually look into our player's data and do some more behavioral segmentation and we see, okay, these are the kind of play patterns that are most common when you have a live game. And then when we tune the strawberry timers, right? And the rewards you're getting, we use that to build a relationship. So we use nine rather than a really ridiculous number that requires your players to stay awake 24 hours a day and click a button every five minutes, which in reality is not gonna happen. And similarly for AR timers, I, I feel like sometimes games can get very unforgiving where they expect you to be on the clock, you know, and just play three yeah. sessions a day exactly. Era. So always being more forgiving to players when we model out these timers. I think having a nine hour timer gives them more comfort or instead of a one day, make it 23 hours, you know, give them an hour like, to like micromanage their schedule. They don't need to be as rigid. So mm. I feel like when you build these relationships now between all these buildings that have different timers, you don't actually use real time, you use a player persona and you use their play pattern and you kind of keep them in mind when you're kind of modeling that out. So it can help give you a more like meaningful measure of the relationship between these timers rather right. than, oh yeah, they are 24 hours in a day. So yeah, our one hour is, I mean, a one hour building is 24 <laughs> times a 24 hour building. Yeah, I see so many games that just use UTC as like the source of truth. And then it's like, you know, I, if I log on, you know, depending on what day, daylight savings time is like 530, I've got like 30 minutes to do everything. Otherwise, it's going to like reset. And then like, yeah, it's uh, very interesting to think on there. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, I do have a question for and I'm, I'm thinking with the mindset of, of someone who's kind of mystified with this idea of like, different player personas playing in very different ways like how have you found is like the best way to figure out like how to kind of segment players based on these play styles and stuff is it really just number of sessions a day and session length or how do you kind of break that up yeah well it's it's a complex process but i'd say i like to triangulate it with three kind of ways like one is my personal intuition I play the game I know my game I think about how our players should be playing the game I try to feel those emotions I put myself in our player persona the second way would be what we call like behave uh, motivational segmentation where we make survey questions and we just ask players hey what do you care about like what are your motivations for playing we ask them bipolar questions and then we we try to figure out what motivates them as a player and the third and i guess the most powerful way is behavioral segmentation which uses analytics data from how players are actually playing the game because sometimes players will say something else oh yeah i'm playing 10 times a day and i play like five minute sessions but when you look at their data they're playing like twice a day or, or they say oh i'm not playing this game at all like like if i'm telling my partner and i'm like oh yeah i don't play uh, the, the the game i'm currently playing but i'll, I'll be like oh yeah I, I don't spend three hours a day playing marvel's right first 
I'd probably say, okay, I'm playing it for 15 minutes three times a day. But in reality, I'm probably spending more time. So that's why I think yeah. um, behavioral segmentation and they do work hand in hand, like knowing my motivations, like seeing that I'm answering questions that say, okay, I'm playing to collect heroes or to progress and upgrade my heroes and feel more powerful are useful. But I, I think like, behavioral segmentation based on actual player behavior is a lot more meaningful. And I can slice this in many different ways. Like I said, early, mid and late game, you'll see different kind of play patterns. And then you can slice it based on time and session length. But that was an example of a builder where it actually helps tune those timers. But then you want to see, and different games have different ways you'd want to slice in it. Like, let's say if I was working on a narrative driven RPG, I'd slice it based on how much story based content you're playing versus how much exploration you're doing that's not story based. And it kind of depends on the game and the primary and secondary personas for those games. But uh, I'd say like sometimes it, I just like put in random parameters that I think might or may not kind of impact it and let the AI do their segmentation and then see like, and sometimes you can find interesting patterns when you look outside the box. So ideally we have a brainstorm with like our analysts and designers and product. And we're like, what all do you think measures can we use to kind of uh, make meaningful differences between our players? And many times if you, funnel it down when it comes to primary like player motivations and how they're making progress towards their short, mid and long term goals. So many times you can relate these, uh, the, the parameters you use to kind of segment players to goal formation. And sometimes you'll find a random parameter that it does not, or you don't understand how that relate, relates to goal formation. But ideally I like to use Bartle's classification and Bartle kept it very simple where you have the world and you have players that uh, interact with other players or with the game world. And then there are players who like to act and that like to interact. And that gave you like four types of classifications where you had killers, those players that like PVP content, you have achievers, those players that like collecting stuff or progressing faster, you had explorers, those players that like to experiment and interact with the game world. And you had socializers, the players that like to interact with other players and fundamentally like most goals can be kind of driven towards these basic motivations mm -hmm. and then just trying to see like okay how do we measure this particular progress towards a goal like how many dailies i'm completing a day or how, how much power i'm getting over time at what rate i'm progressing for an achiever based motivation whereas how many how much vertical how many choices am i trying out for an explorer based motivation uh, am I looking at the leaderboards every day? Am I engaged in teams that perform well in the arena? Am I, what rank I'm finishing in the arena? What league I'm in for killer-based motivations? And then am I sticking to my guild for a long time for socializer-based motivations? How do I participate in community events? And what you'd see is actually most games that I've worked on, players go where the rewards are. So even though your motivations are very different, Let's say like I'm playing Clash of Clans and I have killer-based motivations. I yeah. want to rule the leaderboards, you know, but uh, this was like more than five years back. Uh, what I would do is I'd tank down to a particular town hall level so I, I could easily farm bases and earn rewards, whereas my main motivation wasn't to earn rewards and progress faster, but I did that because I wanted to compete in the leaderboards. So many, many times you need to kind of contextualize it that way because what players do is very different from what motivates them. It's because the rewards are better when they do it that way. Do you think it makes sense? So I'm going to twist this a little bit. So we've got player motivation, but I actually <laughs> think you have session motivation in some senses too. Like when I think about when I was playing Clash of Clans, there were certain sessions that I knew that I logged in because I was going to be doing a clan battle. There were other times that I knew that I was going to farm stuff. And a lot of the times that I logged in were merely just to collect my resources. Um, and, you know, I might have 10 sessions over the day, but each of those sessions, I have a particular like motivation. Like, does it make sense to try to break it down by the motivation of the session? So as an example of making a better player experience, which might impact retention, it might not. But imagine that in Clash of Clans, I forget how many uh, collectors you have but at one point you had to collect like every single one individually 
and it was really tedious and time consuming. Nowadays, I can just collect my gold, collect my elixir and collect my dark elixir, like three taps and I'm done. It's a much better experience for me when I'm logging in with the goal of just collecting my resources because they're full and I want them to keep collecting and then I got to go back to life. Um, does it ever make sense to, I guess, break it down by that motivation so that you can better try to understand what are they doing and how can we make that particular thing better? Yeah, absolutely. You could totally, like, when you see each session length, like, it's very, at a high level, just going, like, longer is better is not true. Like, ideally, we, when we break it down by player personas, we'd be like, okay, this is Tom. He's one of our players, and he likes playing 10 sessions a day, and uh, 10 of these sessions are short, and he just collects resources, and he plays for under a minute. But then he plays one meaningful clan war session a day, which is, uh, say 15 minutes and he engages in a clan war and then he does a few raiding sessions a day which are like three or five minutes in length and we kind of get that pattern and I think that's a more meaningful way when you when you put a player's point of view in mind and build and build your spreadsheet out saying okay these many sessions are pure resource collection sessions these many sessions are battle sessions so he's getting resources from battling and this is a highly engaged clan war session at the end of the war based on winning or losing he has this huge amount of rewards so when we model it out using your player persona and probably there there are millions of players like you who just log in to collect their resources more often and then yeah, I just play game of four, and that's what I did. Like most of the time, I just log in, and yeah. I did the least amount of fighting. I just did shielding, and for a fighting game, a lot of farming, and only during like kill events, I would actually fight. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, um, I want to talk a little bit about the progression curve in a hero collection RPG. Think of Marvel Strike Force. I'm sure, you're familiar with that, or you know. Galaxy of Heroes, Heroes Charge, you know, et cetera. Um, basically where you collect and upgrade heroes. So, you know, can you walk me through what that sort of progression curve should look like? Yeah, like ideally, like I'd say early game, like it should be relatively quick because you want players to kind of experiment and like try out new heroes. Um, you, and if players make mistakes, you want to be forgiving. So I'd like to break the curve down into tiers. Let's say it's broken down into 17 tiers. We like to go very granular with our tiers. So let's say by, by the time a player is at tier 17, uh, tier 16 gets highly inflated. And now tier 16 is kind of easily available to them. So they can explore and spread out and try out more heroes. So the main fundamental behind a hero collector is progression curve is what I like to call focus, like where a player is focusing on one hero and leveling them up versus spread where, where players kind of leveling up a team or a group of heroes and different game modes kind of contribute to this focus versus spread. And then having it broken down into tiers where one tier, like a lower tier gets much easier to get once you reach the next tier, helps with that spread. So, and it helps you not feel bad about focusing as well. So I'd say break it down into many tiers because you're not only thinking about progression of one hero, you have hundreds of heroes or two hundreds of heroes and you're spreading out as well. That's very interesting. Um... When you're thinking about designing this, you know, game economy, you know, some of these games have been running for five plus years. Um, have you ever seen any mistakes or have you made any mistakes of like, you know, on day one, it's like, oh, if I'd only spent a little bit more time doing X, Y, Z, I'd have better goals when players get to year three or year five or, or whatnot within some of these games. Like, what are some things that, maybe I could do in my upcoming hero collection RPG to ensure that my game's going to be stable and I'm going to have reasonable goal goals and progression curve, let's say five years from now. Yeah, absolutely. I make a lot of mistakes. Like that's like, they <laughs> surprise me. Like I always have, like I'm modeling out very specific player patterns, right? Exactly. In your example, where say you play clash of clans 10 times a day, X reward sessions, uh, X collector sections with Y, like, 
a more engaging session. And our players always surprise me. I like to use their data once we're live. And since players always surprise me, I'm about to, I absolutely make mistakes, but I learn from mistakes and I like to build our system so they're flexible. So we can tune them, like not having a very rigid player persona in mind, but being flexible and humble and open to different types of player personas. So I like to think about our systems as, as small little Lego blocks and we put them in together. And ideally they're flexible enough so we can pivot and we can like, it's a live game. We need to see how our players are playing the game and kind of adapt based on how they're playing the game. And month over month, so I like to make it feel like the game's get always getting more rewarding as you progress. So say if you're earning a million gold a day every day for a month, for month one, then month two, you, there's some reward inflation and now you're doing like 1.1 mil gold a day. And then month three, you're doing like 1.12 mil gold a day and so on. So there's some form of reward progression. So I'd say like one thing I've learned is like be generous and when you plan for like a reward system coming out, say in six months, plan for that inflation in mind. Don't think linear. Like you do want the game to be more engaging month over month to, to engage and retain our players. So we want to kind of give you more rewards every month rather than having like a linear kind of mentality. So if I had to give one tip is like model things out when you're planning with inflation in mind, rather than thinking it's stuff's just going to be linear and doing simple math. <laughs> Yeah. Does it make sense to plan kind of holes in your economy? So maybe like an example, like, okay, day one, I'm planning on having damage on my weapons, you know, with an average, you know, DPS of this, you know, sword is let's say seven, but I know that in the future, I'm going to want to add things like critical strike chance and critical strike damage, and maybe get into like electric or fire damage or like, does it make sense to kind of have holes? Like maybe I haven't figured them out today, but I know that once I get to year three, maybe I'm going to have to start to add some of these things. And then year five, I'm going to have to like fill in the blank of, you know, whatever else, like, does it make sense to kind of build that in for a future, you know, use case? Uh, absolutely. I think of those holes as Lego blocks that haven't come in yet. So when you build your first hole, like mm -hmm. your first system, Think of it as a Lego block and there are other Lego, block, Lego blocks like crit damage and stuff that are yet to come. But ideally, damage alone should feel rewarding and engaging enough to players right now. But we, we yep. shouldn't build the system blocking out crit damage from coming in in the future. Like eventually, if we had to add it in, it should, it should be like another Lego block and they kind of fit in properly rather than we're like, oh, no, critical damage can never be a thing in our game. Let's let's design that, let's call it a design decision on day one. And then five years down the line, we'll be like, oh, we want critical damage and we don't have to go back and re-engineer re everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's say I'm in a different boat and I didn't really build my game to have those building blocks, but now I'm to the point where my players are kind of running out of things to do and I know that I need to add something. I don't know if you've ever run into a case like that, but is it possible to not completely break your game while still adding some of these like new goals for these late game players to do? It is possible, but it, this is actually more like a production point of view. Like I worked on this looter shooter sometime back where we had 10 hours worth of game and it was meant to be like a five year old five year long life service with 10 hours worth of gameplay. So there's only so much you can do with a 10 hour game. Um, you could add another system and the core loop of the game needs to scale. So if the core loop scales, you can always build up on top of it. But if, if the core loop is not very scalable, it gets very hard to kind of scale. So yeah, players always run out of stuff to do. You'd be surprised how many players finish the game on day one. And... Yeah. Do you have any like tips or tricks on on how to like mitigate that for the players that are just going to like obsessively go through the content? Because I, I feel like no matter how perfectly you model out the game economy of like, oh, you know, players play this per day and we do it this fast, they'll get done in about 30 days. And then like two days later, you've got players that are already done with it. Like, is there any way to kind of mitigate that and make sure those players have something new or... 
I think you can have aspirational content that always gives players something like an end game mode that's really hard or it takes really long to reach, but your most hyper engaged players will reach there anyways. And they actually stay the most engaged. So what I've learned like from experience, like let the hyper engaged players be hyper engaged and play the game like they do. But at the same time, tailor your game for like your, your elder game players that aren't as hyper engaged, you're more like, average player personas that are the majority of your player base rather than the end which is highly schooled like they're playing the game for maybe 20 hours a day like especially on launch week you'd see those patterns like ideally you model it for a player persona that makes sense and probably they're gonna run out of content like i mean making games gets expensive and especially on the AAA space, like making content gets expensive. Ideally, I, I do, I'm a huge fan of Diablo and I think they do it very well where they find very efficient ways, really powerful systems to scale their content. So they, I guess their one dungeon just scales so well procedurally and they just have stat inflation over stat inflation and scale so nicely. Mm. Whereas when you do bespoke level design for a single player story game, it, single player story driven game it makes sense but when you want to run a five year old life five year long life service having highly bespoke story driven content that's not highly flexible it's not like a lego block where you can't attach another lego block to whereas if you see any system in diablo all the systems work together nicely holistically so you can actually fit these lego blocks in with each yeah. other but I'd say in that case, like think about what your core loop is and how you can add something that complements that core loop, but scales in the future and it will help your game scale. Do you think it makes sense or like that it's an essential tool to have, you know, some way to basically tweak any of these different numbers and levels and, and things just, you know, all over the air in a system, whether it's you know, a full backend live ops platform or even just like raw JSON or something like that. But like, should you be able to tweak all of these things kind of over the air on the fly? Well, if you have a live game, of course you want to tune your economy. We do want to have something in between where we can play test it on say QA or a bunch of play testers before going directly live to players. But I really am a huge fan of, like I started my days when CSVs were a thing and everything was just in spreadsheet and you didn't have to convert it to XML or JSON. The game was just running from spreadsheets and we still use spreadsheets. So ideally uh, I'm a huge proponent of spreadsheet import export. So you should be able to import your economy data from a spreadsheet and export it as well to see how the economy is doing. But uh, import is a lot more valuable and it helps you iterate quickly and probably have a test server where only a small group of highly engaged players can feel that experience and see how it feels. Because in the end, when you're tuning a game economy, you're making many assumptions. Building relationships between rewards helps make less assumptions, but still you're making like many assumptions and your players are gonna surprise you. So you wanna play test it on players beforehand. Yeah. So test server, like a beta test server is usually very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, does it ever make sense to, how to say this, kind of have different versions of the game economy based on players, like, I don't know, location in the game or play styles or different things like that. You know, I, I think about, you know, my daily quests for my elder players are much harder than the same daily quests for my new players, but I get better rewards, you know, if I complete them as an elder player kind of a thing. Yeah, absolutely. I'm all for personalizing the experience based on player progress. So like for early game, mid game and late game player, we have a different set of dailies with different rewards that are not more meaningful for them. Like say early game, giving you an end game resource doesn't really do much for your journey. It just motivates you to hoard it until you reach end game. So I'd rather have an easier quest that is teaching you what to do early game, but giving you rewards more suitable for your level. But when it comes to segmentation, I, personalizing things, 
in a social multiplayer game, not based off player progression, I feel fairness comes into play. Like I'd love to experiment and see, you know, what's the optimal kind of end game experience. But in the end, it's a social game. To be fair to all our players, we want a similar experience for each type of end game player. So suppose I'm an end game player and you're an end game player. We'd like to give you all this. Both of us should have like a fair playing field. So ideally for that end game player, we have the same set of dailies. And you get similar rewards. I mean, there can be some randomization in those rewards if it's like a, a loot box system or something. But in the end, we both have the same odds to roll something good from those rewards. Whereas for early game players, like uh, eventually when they reach end game, they'll get those rewards. So it's kind of fair to them. Gotcha. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, uh, you talked about a looter shooter a little bit, but can you tell me like how does that economy kind of differ from say the hero collection economy how does progression change a little bit how's the power curve work like yeah yeah since i'm a big fan of player personas i'll start with like a player persona so in a yeah. shooter, a player's primary motivation is to kill stuff faster so basically your primary goal is like you want to shoot stuff and it should die like that that's the core fundamental loop so you want to progress and progress in a looter shooter means like how fast you're killing stuff. Like it takes you X seconds to kill a baseline enemy. And as you're progressing, okay, it takes you Y seconds to kill a baseline enemy. And that power curve should impact the progression curve. So instead of thinking, oh, 100 power, 200 power, 300 power, think about how long it takes to kill a baseline enemy and see how that's tuned over time. And usually it's uh, very rewarding at the start. It's like a power curve. And oh, when you reach end game, it, pretty much gives you very, very incremental rewards over a long period of time. But at that point, you're just chasing the number going up. Whereas early game, you do feel like you're killing things faster. But then end game, uh, enemies scale faster as well. So I'd say for a looter shooter, it's like a power curve. For a hero collection game, I feel it's more, your primary motivation is to collect heroes. I think the fundamental uh, your is heroes. I like to use heroes. It means like, okay, how much progress you're making towards a hero, since that's what a player's primary motivation is. So all our things like instead of saying 10 million gold, like I'd be like, okay, that is 50% hero worth of gold. So we basically divide everything by its sinks. That meaning like how much it costs to in that resource to max out a hero and that's like a fundamental unit and now we have hundreds of resources but all of them use the same unit so now we when we model out the hero curve we just use heroes and we see all our resources on one end and then we just go like okay we'll give out 3.2 heroes worth of this resource every month and 2.4 heroes worth of this resource. And it, it's kind of the fundamental atomic unit we use to balance the game and the curve is derived from that. If that makes sense. Without a spreadsheet, it gets very tricky to show. <laughs> but basically since our primary motivation is to collect heroes, we use that to build relationships between all our rewards. So say if there's gold and then there's another resource, let's call it gear. Um, but when we compare units of gear and gold, we use hero as the metric. That means what's your sink in that hero, like how, how much gold you can spend to max out a hero would be the sink. So basically everything is a percentage of what it costs to max out one hero. So it just scales with heroes. And as we add new heroes in, it just scales because our fundamental unit is a hero. Or how, how, many, how much of a resource it costs to max out that hero. Interesting. Okay. So you do have to actually figure out how much it really costs to max out a hero. Like, and like, if I, I think of like, let's say Diablo two, like, what does it actually mean to even max out a hero there? Because you have endless combinations of gear that you could find and tweak and, and rarities. Like, can you, could you ever even finish a hero? I think yes, yes, you can, but towards the end of the curve, we call it more like horizontal progression, where vertical progression is you're getting more power, right? You mm -hmm. see that going up, you're killing stuff faster. You see a number going up, but towards the end, 
I think horizontal progression means these bills have synergy with each other. So, okay, you find one item in Diablo on a second item. Now both these items give, have synergy with each other. And suddenly you have like a 10,000 percentage buff and then a 40,000 percentage buff. And you find the fourth item and they just all kind of give you this horizontal progression, which is very hard to measure, but it's a thing. Uh, I like to measure it in choice. It's like how many choices you have for horizontal progression. Whereas vertical progression is pure power, like how much damage you're doing per second. I got you. Yeah, you're probably right. Even in Diablo 2, like once you get most of your core gear, that like last little optimization things doesn't really change too much. But okay, okay. I got you. Um, cool. Let's talk a look because I know we're kind of running low on time here. Um, let's talk about city builders for a bit. Um, tell me about city builders progression and specifically, I'm curious, are there any ways to, how do you even call it? Um, I remember I was talking to a guy one time. This was, I think it was my first GDC. Uh, it was a while back. Um, but he was telling me about his experience with Clash of Clans. He loved the game. And he said, you know, early on, I was probably dropping about $100 per week in Clash of Clans. And I did that for about three years. But after that, like, I haven't spent a dime because, you know, or originally I'd spend $100 and I'd get all this stuff and it feel really, really great. But now if I spend $100, like, I can maybe upgrade maybe one thing. And I have, you know, hundreds of things to upgrade. And it's just like, it feels, it's like, instead of every, you know, purchase feeling as good or better, it's like every single purchase just makes him feel worse until he finally just quit spending. So I'm curious, like, are there ways to beat that sort of feeling so that it still feels good with these types of games? Or are they all kind of doomed to this sort of like, big spend early that slowly tapers off over time? Uh, I think social is the way to kind of push those motivations because yes, I mean, you're absolutely correct. Like in Clash of Clans, if you spend early, like you get a lot of progress for spend. Like your fundamental motivation is to build your base, right? And become more powerful and go up in stats and make building upgrades. And you're gonna make more upgrades at the start and that's why it's cheaper to make each upgrade. But towards the end, I, I think it should be more about the clan and less about the individual. So now you're engaging in these end game social activities that, and if you join a guild that where everyone spends and there's social spend and you're spending on like this cool new thing or you're trying this new strategy around. But when it comes to like the buildings, it does become very expensive to kind of max out an entire town or level. But I'd say that that's where consumable things become really powerful like so if they build like monthly spending habits let's say I boost my barracks every day and I do that for a month and I join a guild and all my guildmates also boost our barracks and we rate together and we share that in chat and it's cool to spend you know this usually the social stigma stigma against spend and I think having the right kind of social helps even solve that stigma now suppose that, that consumable spend has become part of my daily routine I'm just used to playing that game with my barracks boosted and over time I'd still kind of drive that consumable spend but dur durable spend is going to get more expensive because it, it is a power curve right in the end you have sporadic rewards and towards the end uh, each upgrade is going to give you very little progress like I think by the time I turned in class of plans, like I'd farm like a full week and I could upgrade one wall, which doesn't really make much of a difference to my progress. But then I guess building end game systems like Diablo does can also help solve that problem where, okay, you're not progressing with your wall, but hey, it's like you're researching this new unit and there's this new type of, you're getting some reward every mm -hmm. week rather than one wall upgrade because it wouldn't feel good to spend to upgrade just a wall yeah no that makes sense um cool are there any other you know if i'm thinking about you know designing economy for a city city builder like how how have you seen that be successful or or if we decided to make a city builder today like are, are there some things that you would do differently than you've seen top games do it previously? 
Well, when I worked on the settlers online a long time back, I'd like to break, like I spoke about, you know, like uh, uh, progress towards a hero or DPS, like uh, how much damage, how fast you kill an enemy, uh, a baseline enemy for a looter shooter. I think for builders, how much progress you make towards the next tier. So you want to break your game down into tiers and in the end, it does get very slow. Think about how, uh, how how you get players into those consumable routines and get them into a social guild to kind of have more social end game features. I think Clash of Clans had a really powerful loop. It's, it's the only game that I joined and I came back to. Like, I think I played for a while. I, I maxed out at Town Hall 9 at that time, and then I quit. Then my entire clan came back for Clan Wars, and it's the social that got us in. And it's in Clan Wars that, oh, okay, a Clan war starting. I'm low on troops. Okay, I'll rush a few troops. Okay, you need some troops. I'm donating them to you. Okay, I'll rush a few troops and donate it to my friend. And I, I think socials where the end game is, not pure building. That's where I think the end game motivations should be more social than like PvE. Uh, I mean, PvP based, team based PvP, but having those co op social kind of interactions where I can boost troops and send them to you to help you out in a war. And when we win the war, both of us benefit. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, social was the entire reason that I played Clash of Clans after I don't know how long, but you know, it was pretty much all about camp, Clan Wars. On Facebook, I think what Clash of Clans innovated with, I used to play this game called Monsters Backyard, Backyard Monsters on Facebook a long time back. And it was a very yeah. simple game. Mm -hmm. um, but every building looked, it was basically Clash of Clans on Facebook before Clash of Clans was a thing. But every building looked the same. Like every building, like in Clash of Clans, you can clearly see a resource collector and a Defensive building look very different, right? A resource collector looks appealing. It looks like you can touch it. It looks like you can collect resources from it. Whereas, uh, say, a mortar or a archer tower looks aggressive. It looks like uh, an aggressive building, which you want to kind of take out. Uh, in backyard monsters, all the buildings looked aggressive. So you didn't know what a resource collector was, or you didn't know what a, a defensive tower was. And, uh, what class of clans did is they made it a lot more accessible like just to, through clear kind of signs and feedback where you can make out the difference between a resource collector and a defensive structure and i think that really resonated with me as a player because it was very easy for me to read maps and come up with strategies once i could see the level design but its fundamentals were the same right it's basically two core loops there was a base builder and then there's a, a combat side of it where one person's level, your level design is someone's base, right? So it scales so well. As long as you have players, they're, they're making levels for your other players that want to attack a player. So it kind of, that loop was very powerful. Super cool. Interesting. So it's almost like now, do you think that Backyard Monsters was just kind of like an untapped, let's say like a blue ocean and a red ocean kind of opportunity, and they just better understood like what was challenging about that and they made it better? Or um, was there something more to it, do you think? I think like if I saw Backyard Mon, I mean, and it played a lot better. It was designed from the ground up for touch, like just tapping. Yeah felt good, like the controls, like what I call the three Cs, character controls and camera, they played a lot better on mobile versus tapping all around with your mouse. But I, I'd say, I think they took a known reference. They took a very powerful call loop that just scales because one player's base becomes another player's level design. And now you have an infinite set of level design and you don't even have to have, build a team to churn out levels. And I think that fundamental core loop was there in Backyard Monsters, but it just didn't appeal to players as much because of unclear signs and feedback and the three Cs weren't as engaging. So I think, I mean, Clash of Clans is a really successful game and I wouldn't do anything differently. I'd probably get a larger team because from what <laughs> I've heard, they, had to, they were a very small team. They were very super cell, but they had to crunch a lot. So I believe they could have had a better work-life balance if they had more help. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think in uh, Ilka's most recent uh, acknowledgement, they kind of said they're, they're doing bigger teams on their, you know, live games now too, which is interesting. 
but uh, cool stuff. Uh, okay, so we're pretty much out of time here. So I have one more uh, question for you. It's the unofficial question because we are, of course, on the Mastering Retention podcast. And um, that is, what's one tip or trick or lesson you've learned over the years to help increase retention? This could be early game retention or long-term retention, like however you want to break it out. Like, how do you keep players coming back day after day, ideally year after year? Like, how do you encourage them to come back to your game? I'd say understanding your player personas and their primary motivations would be my one tip. Like, build a player persona for your game if you don't have one, because it's different from game to game. And I'd say be more generous to your players based on their player personas and their motivations. So make sure they're making progress towards their motivations. Many times I see teams where they're like, oh, I like the game, and designers are just designing games for themselves, where in the end, only they'll play the game. But when you kind of build a player persona with data, you actually have a big, you know, a, there's a market that has this kind of, these kinds of motivations to play your game. So I'd say it helps you understand your players better. Because many people don't see the ROI in doing like segmentation work to come up with a player persona. I, I feel that's the key to understanding retention because in the end, it's, I think retention has a co-relationship with a player completing their short, mid and long-term goals. And if you map out a player's short, mid and long-term goal completion to their retention, you'd see really strong correlations. And then you can put it into a map. But then the trick is like, okay, suppose my motivation is complete 10 dailies. So you see, oh, all players that complete 10 dailies are playing for 10 days. But is it because they've completed 10 dailies or is it because they're playing for 10 days? That's when you need to look ahead. So you say, oh, okay, players that have reached day 30, did they complete their first 10 day, first seven dailies mm -hmm. by day seven? So you kind of use it to predict. So I, I'd say just understand your players, their motivations, what short, mid and long-term goals they have and how these goals correlate to retention is the tip I'd give you to improve retention and it can change early game it's more about confusion and sometimes you can just play your fatui and be like okay players are turning here it's not clear i'm like that time don't do too much research just go and change the fatui and see how it does yeah but i think for long-term retention it's it's based on clear goals and motivations that's great i love it well thank you so much Heider. um if people do have any like questions for you about anything like is there a good way for them to get in contact with you yeah, you can get in touch with me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook. I'm more, I'm old, so I'm more active on Facebook because I started off my career making Facebook games. But you can just find me on Facebook, Hyder uh, CW. It's not a very popular name. <laughs> Love it. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Hyder. Thank you so much, Tom.